Hello everybody, my name is Kotaro Ono, I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington at the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, and I'm going to be presenting today a work that has been done in collaboration between the University of Washington and the University of California Santa Barbara within the Sea Grant project. And the work is entitled, How do populations respond to fishing? A spatial temporal investigation of population seasonal dynamics. Species distribution modeling is an important tool in ecology to help us understand the basic biology of the species and their habitat use, but it is also an important tool for conservation planning and resource management, especially for species with an important economic and cultural value such as salmon in the Pacific Northwest. And what this species distribution modeling try to do is to explain variation in species observation by different covariates, such as environmental factors like temperature, depth, and precipitation, and also some anthropogenic factors, such as fishing pressure in the case of fishery example. And to do so, we need statistical models. These models take the data from the field and the different maps of habitat information to create a predicted map of species presence or a map of species abundance. And in this study, we're going to be taking the example of Dover sole of the U.S. West Coast. Dover sole is a commercially important flatfish species that is widely distributed along the West Coast on muddy sandy bottom, which makes it a perfect candidate in order to study their, its distribution. And what we will be specifically looking at in this study is to examine how Dover sole population responds to fishing activity. And to do so, we're going to be looking at the seasonal changes in population abundance. Then, we're going to be examining whether there are areas along the coast which show a consistent surplus of deficit in abundance. And finally, we're going to be looking at whether these observed changes are mainly due to fishing activity or whether it could be explained by other biological or or environmental factors. And what we have is three large spatial temporal data sets. The first data is a bottom trawl survey between summer and fall 2004 to 2011. The second data set is a logbook data that covers the same time period as a bottom trawl survey, which gives us information about the spatially referenced catch data. And the final data is the habitat maps of temperature, depth, and sediment size along the U.S. West Coast. So the idea is as follows. There are two surveys that are conducted every year, one around May and one around August, which leaves about two months and a half gap between those two survey periods. And what can happen in two months and a half? Well, fish can grow, fish can move between areas, new recruitment can happen, and also fish can not die due to natural causes, but also due to fishing activity. So by using those survey data in combination with the environmental data that we have collected, we can then create a, a predicted map of uh, the overall population along the west coast for each survey period. And then by examining the change in the biomass between the two survey periods, we're going to be looking at the effect of catches and the effect of net change in biomass, which is an enumerative measure of growth, death, recruitment, and movement to the changes in biomass within the season. So, for example, if the changes in biomass is mainly explained by catches, then we expect that the net change in biomass is around zero. And there are several ways we can calculate the net change in biomass in this study. If our interest is in examining the changes in biomass that happen between spring and summertime, then we're going to be looking at the changes in biomass between the second pass and the first pass of the same year. But instead, if we are interested in examining the changes that happen between autumn and wintertime, then we're going to be looking at the changes in biomass between the first pass of the second year and the second pass of the first year. And all the calculation of biomass and prediction of biomass in this study 
has been done on a 2x2 grid cell using a novel spatial temporal model. So after running all those models, what you can finally obtain is an estimate of the for biomass along the US West Coast for each of the survey passes and for every year where we have the data. And what we can see from this graph is that first, that there is a lot of variation in the for biomass across years. And second, there is a lot of also differences of the for biomass depending on the location on the coast. And three, there are some differences in universal biomass between a survey pass 1 and survey pass 2. This makes us wonder whether the change in population abundance between the two survey passes is due to the fishing activity that happens between those two trunk surveys. And in order to answer this, we have represented in this plot the change in biomass between the survey pass 2 and the survey pass 1. Uh, plotted against the catches. So if uh, the changes in population is mainly explained by the catches, we're supposed to see a pattern or a trend in this graph. But instead, what we see is that there is no pa obvious pattern in this graph, and that all the dots are distributed randomly around in the plot. And this potentially means that the effect of fishing is minimal in the case of Toroso, and that might not be the main reason explaining the changes in population abundance between the two survey passes. So what else can create these changes in population between passes? In the plot B, I have summarized the median across years of the net change in biomass between August and May of the same year. And in graph C, have shown the median across years of the net change in biomass between May and August of different years. And the main take-home message from these plots is that, one, there are several areas along the coast which shows a local surplus or local deficit in the overall population that changes between the season, and that these patterns are almost exactly the opposite between graph B and C. And this is furthermore confirmed with the graph D, which shows a plot of median NCB1 against median NCB2, and it shows that there is a pretty good negative correlation between those two values. And what all of this indicates is that seasonal movement might be the main reason behind these changes in biomass for the Dorosol case. And can we potentially relate these movement to environmental factors? In order to answer this, we have shown in these plots that some of the main factors that have shown to be influencing the changes in net change in biomass between August and May of the same year. And one of the factors that was influential was the depth. And it seems like that the biomass of the decreased between 100 and 400 meters roughly to increase in deeper water. And, uh, and it seems also that the Dover Soul seems to congregate in the northern region during the summertime, and that their biomass also increase with distance to rocks. But all of these observations could potentially be related to movement, but for now, we cannot reject the possibility that there are other dynamics that can explain those, these changes in biomass and those dynamics could be related to growth differential or recruitment. But in order to confirm this, what we need to do is to repeat the same analysis, but this time looking at the net change in biomass between May and August of different years, and if we see at the exact opposite pattern of the influence of these different factors to so the change in biomass, then we can be more sure that movement was indeed the main factor influencing those changes in biomass. And when we do this, indeed, we obtain the almost the exact opposite pattern of variation in net change in biomass uh, due to those different factors, which confirms again that changes in biomass in Dorosol is maybe due to movement and not to differential growth or recruitment or other dynamics. 
So to summarize what we have found in this study, we have detected several areas along the coast with consistent seasonal local deficit and surplus in population. And this highlights the need for a flexible management method if we needed to predict this, this species. For example, if we have used a fixed spatial management for this species, this method might not have been working as the species is showing a high seasonal variability in abundance. And these observed patterns of oversold biomass within the season was not shaped by fishing activity, but was rather shaped by the seasonal movement of the species due to ontogeny, for example. Uh, separating the role of growth, recruitment, and movement on the spatial pattern in production is going to be an important topic for future research that we have to keep in mind. And it will be also interesting to expand this study on many other marine species by taking advantage of the available data. And especially, it will be interesting to do a comparison work with another species, but with a higher exploitation rate than Doversol. Thank you very much for listening, and now I'm open to any question that you would like to ask me.